Thank you so much, Daryl. And uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, early launch of Juneteenth celebration with the Somerset Library community. I'm very honored to be here with you tonight. I'll speak on um, kind of celebrating Juneteenth, but also defining freedom for about 45 minutes. And then we have some time for conversation. And what I invite you to do is I uh, pull up the slides now uh, for this presentation. As I go through it, I invite you to think about um, aspects of the, of the conversation that you find uh, surprising or the most interesting um, or even the most problematic. And so please feel free to um, put your questions in the chat or as a small group, we may just have an open conversation together at the end of the presentation. So let's begin. In his 1852 4th of July speech in Rochester, New York, the abolitionist Frederick Douglass, activist, writer, lecturer, um, admonished the crowd on this 4th of July when he included these words to the crowd. And Douglas says, what to the American slave is the 4th of July? I answer, a day that reveals to him more than all other days in the year, the gross injustice and cruelty to which he is the constant victim. To him, your celebration is a sham, your boasted liberty and unholy license, your national greatness, swelling vanity, your sounds of rejoicing are empty and heartless, your denunciation of tyrants, brass fronted impudence, your shouts of liberty and equality, hollow mockery, your prayers and hymns, your sermons and thanksgivings with all your religious parade and solemnity are to him mere bombast, fraud, deception, impiety, and hypocrisy. There is not a nation on the earth guilty of practices more shocking and bloody than are the people of these United States at this very hour. And so I begin by introducing to you this notion of freedom and celebration that Frederick Douglass turns on his head and says, the enslaved man and woman and child cannot celebrate freedom in 1852. An unholy license and a hollow mockery was Frederick Douglass's definition of American freedom in 1852, only nine years before the start of the Civil War. Douglass had witnessed the United States not only compromise and limit Black freedom, but he had lived to see the nation actually expand and protect the enslavement and the rights of those who claim to own human beings as property. Four million enslaved people, almost 400,000 free people of color and their abolitionist allies had compelling reasons, right? To neither celebrate nor rejoice on the 4th of July before the Civil War. So like Douglas, they knew that freedom first had to be redefined, reimagined, and reconstructed to actually include everyone in the nation. If the struggle to define freedom is simultaneously an intellectual, social, economic, and political contest, according to historian Eric Foner, then the Civil War demonstrated that freedom was also a military contest as well. I was with General Grant when Lee surrendered at Appomattox. That was freedom, said Private William Harrison of the 45th U.S. Colored Troops who came from New Jersey, Virginia, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania. 
we, the colored soldiers, have fairly won our rights by loyalty and bravery. Shall we obtain them? If they are refused now, we shall demand them, says Sergeant Major William McCosklin of the 29th U.S. Colored Infantry from Illinois. Private Harrison and Sergeant McCloskin were among the seven regiments of 5,000 United States colored troops who fought at Appomattox and among the 200,000 black troops that fought in the Civil War. When we add these soldiers to the number of black people who served as spies for the Union Army, like Harriet Tubman, Marianne Browser, and Mary Tuverstree, and those who provided the army with food and sustenance, and the number of black adults and children who went, ran away from so-called masters and mistresses. We realized that for black people, the Civil War was a freedom revolution where black people fought to reclaim ownership of black labor and ownership of black bodies and to reclaim the sanctity of black households and families and to fight because of a true belief in American democracy and American freedom. The surrender of Robert E. Lee's army of North, uh, Northern Virginia at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865, and the surrender of Confederate armies in the West, west of the Mississippi on June 2, 1865, signaled the end of the Civil War, although battles continued into 1866. But for Black people, whether living under quasi-freedom in the North or enslaved in the South, the war and its end meant one thing. It meant freedom. In 1866, African Americans in Washington, D.C. celebrated the compensated Emancipation Proclamation. And I'll pause here just to say that uh, Emancipated uh, Proclamation uh, or Compensated Proclamation means, in fact, that uh, people received uh, compensation for their enslaved people in the nation's capital. In 1866, African Americans in Washington, D.C. celebrated this Compensation Emancipation Act, which abolished slavery in Washington, D.C. on April 16, 1862. And so what I want you to see here is the notion of celebrating freedom actually precedes what we call Juneteenth. In her book, First Freed, Washington, D.C. in the Emancipation Era, historian Elizabeth Clark Lewis describes how Black organizations, clubs, militia groups, and veterans paraded down the streets of the nation's capital, past the White House to Lafayette Square, where enslaved people had been bought and sold. But in 1866, African Americans in the nation's capital claimed Lafayette Square as a public space of freedom and a public space to celebrate freedom. Following the Civil War, African-American communities throughout the nation claimed public space to celebrate the anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. African-Americans in Northern Virginia celebrated Lee's defeat at Appomattox on April 9th, 1865 as Surrender Day. Richmond's African-American community celebrated April 3rd, 1865, the date when US troops took control of the city during the Civil War. Unlike these East Coast, African-American communities that had witnessed the gradual abolition of slavery before and during the war. Texans lived on the fringes of the war with few Union troops and minimal fighting and no news of emancipation. So finally, on June 19, 1865, in the city of Galveston, Texas, Major General Gordon Granger read to the people of Texas his General Order Number Three, which included these words. The people of Texas 
Congress are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves, and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that of employer and hired labor. Juneteenth is a contraction for June 19th. Beginning in 1867, Black Texans in Austin celebrated and commemorated this Freedom Day for the first time as depicted in these photos of the 1900th celebration in Austin's Eastwoods Park, where we see the Celebration Day ban and we see people dressed in their finest attire and we see Civil War and actors, and of course, the all-American picnic at all celebrations. Black people in Texas, in this uh, Eastwoods area outside of Austin, celebrate it with prayer services and baseball games and parades. Black freedom also transformed celebration into liberation. In 1872, a group of Black community leaders in Texas, all formerly enslaved, pulled together $800, a value of almost $20,000 today, and purchased land as home for their uh, Juneteenth celebration and named it Emancipation Park. When Black Texans then migrated to Louisiana, to Oklahoma, to California, and other places, they took Juneteenth with them. But it was never celebrated nationwide. It really was a Texas celebration. Rather, freedom celebrations like the examples I've given you early in Washington, D.C., in Virginia, as well as in Texas, were local, regional, or statewide representing that particular history of emancipation. Juneteenth and other public African-American commemorations, though were more than celebrations of freedom in no matter where they occurred, they were revolutionary because Black people claimed public space, claimed Black pride, claimed Black ambition. We publicly celebrated ourselves, and that in itself was freedom. Freedom is and, and was not just a word on a piece of paper, and we know that from our own experiences today, that freedom, in fact, is very complicated, even if it's a proclamation from the mouth of the president or military general. Black freedom really required agency and autonomy and activism to dismantle racist constructions in order to, again, redefine, reimagine, and reconstruct freedom to be inclusive of all people in this great nation. Thomas Nass, 1862 illustration that you see on the screen now, illustrates Black bodies beaten, bought, and sold on the far left. But with, with emancipation, as you see, gleaming in the center comes Black families and Black community and Black citizenship through education, paid employment, as depicted in the center and on the right side of the screen. The complete victory for African Americans should have been guaranteed by the Emancipation Proclamation and the 13th Amendment, both coming right at the end of the war in 1865. But African Americans found that the earlier definitions of race and racism, having evolved in the British North American colonies over 250 years, were still firmly intact after these four years of war. And the, the definitions of race that protected and, and embraced white supremacy were firmly intact at the end of the Civil War. 
the 360,000 U.S. Army deaths in the Civil War and the assassination of a president stood little chance of shifting the long-held view of white Americans that Black lives did not matter except as laborers and as property. So immediately following the war, Southern legislatures established Black codes to create what Pulitzer Prize winner Douglas Blackman called slavery by another name. The South successfully began to re-enslave Black people by controlling Black bodies through labor, intimidation, violence, and incarceration. Immediately following the end of the war, white supremacy, the idea that white people were ordained to subjugate Black people, was, was determined to snuff out Black liberty and, if necessary, Black people altogether. Vagrancy laws encourage law enforcement to round up Black men and boys for no reason other than being in public without proof of employment. Black mobility and Black presence in public spaces was criminalized, not celebrated. Labor contracts required African Americans to work for little more than food and shelter and required them to show proof of employment or be arrested as vagrants. Uh, very little difference, actually, right, between enslavement and vagrancy laws. Slave labor was transformed into convict labor. There were restrictions on farming and where Black people could rent farm land. Workers who ran away were captured and returned to the landowner. Black children in state custody were bound to involuntary apprenticeships. The entire judicial system was defined by race with separate courts and different punishments determined solely by race. Black people were excluded from voting, from public office, from serving in the local militia, from carrying guns and from jury duty. Laws required Black subservience and so social behavior and etiquette. You could, a Black person could not look a white person in the eye. A Black person would have to move off of the sidewalk to make room for a white person. And all the way into the 20th century as well, Black people were expected to wait in line, go to the back door, and seat, sit in separate sections of any kind of public um, uh, transportation. Education for Black children was restricted and limited if it existed at all. And then where these codes left off, vigilante violence filled in the gaps. The Ku Klux Klan was founded in Pulaski, Tennessee in 1865. It united former Confederates uh, into a kind of paramilitary force that terrorized, threatened, and killed thousands of Black people to keep them out of politics. And it sought to kill Black aspiration by burning Black churches, schools, and businesses. The Equal Justice Initiative reports that there were 2,000 lynchings in the 1860s alone, and over 4,000 lynchings in the 20, 20th century, 654 lynchings in the state of Mississippi alone. Congress then retaliates against these Black codes that the South puts into place to kind of continue uh, the enslavement of Black people. So Congress pushes back and retaliates against these codes and the racial violence against Black people with progressive legislation that sought to contain the presidential power uh, of the um, uh, now president, former vice president, Andrew Johnson. And then Congress tries to punish the South, reduce the power of Southern Democrats in favor of Northern Republicans, the party of Lincoln. And they try to empower the Black male vote as an ally of the Republican Party and to protect Black civil and constitutional rights. So one of Congress's first congressional acts 
was to establish the Bureau of Refugees, Freedmen, and Abandoned Land, known as the Freedmen's Bureau by most of us. This was passed in, by Act of Congress in March 1865, a month before the war actually ends. Under the control of the U.S. Army, at its best, the Bureau and the U.S. Army provided physical protection, education, review of these labor contracts I talked about, and access to land ownership for the newly freed Black people. But the Bureau is perhaps one of this period's most stark symbols of the failure of Reconstruction to live up to its progressive promises and potential. The Bureau was never fully equipped to handle the enormity of post-war destitution, starvation, homelessness, and illness, not only enslaved people, but the destitution throughout the entire South. There was chronic starvation because of the war and the destruction of crops. The federal government's uh, policies were often partial and temporary. Individual bureau agents sometimes embraced and supported the white farmers and land tenancy and sharecropping rather than protecting the lives of Black people. The Bureau tried, there were some efforts, tried to shift um, poor Black and white people off of sharecropping and land tenancy, which, as you know, keeps people in perpetual debt. And by uh, passing the 1866 Southern Homestead Act, a law which allowed public land to be sold cheaply to poor people, black and white. This is very similar to the Homestead Act for the Western states where people were encouraged to go and buy land very cheaply and to set up homesteads. In 1869, though, only four years after the Bureau had been established, it in fact was entirely dissolved. In 1877, the federal troops, the army that was also uh, uh, from a Southern point of view, uh, an occupying army left the South and by leaving it, it left black people completely unprotected from white violence. Federal legislation also played a major role of this, of, of Congress pushing back uh, and constitutional amendments, reconstruction amendments were passed that widened the window of opportunity for black citizenship and protection. And you see a list of these on the screen. The 14th Amendment defined citizenship as it still does. This is where we find the due process clause and it also guaranteed equal protection under the law. The Reconstruction Acts of 1867 and 1868 established that military control over the former Confederate states. It required Southern states to write new state constitutions. It allowed for universal male suffrage and the ratification of the 13th Amendment. And here we also see Congress puts into place Civil Rights Acts. These are the first civil rights acts for the United States. In some ways, they mirror the Bill of Rights and protecting individuals. What these acts do, almost identical to the Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s, was to legislate against discrimination. And then finally, the 15th Amendment will give Black men the right to vote. So ultimately, this period after the Civil War was one of promises made, and there is a reason, in fact, to celebrate throughout the nation, but also it's a period of promises denied. It was a time of conflicting federal policies brought on by Lincoln's assassination, President Andrew Johnson's conciliatory pardon of Confederate leaders, traitors, to the United States, and a regressive federal policy that placed the former Confederates back in power between 1865 and 66, followed by this short window when Congress tries to put into place protective legislation and rights of Black people. <laughs> 
as conflicting policies and centuries old racial constructions guaranteed an incomplete victory for American freedom and democracy. African-Americans still asserted their own definition of freedom. And one way was by telling their stories, which were recorded by the Freedmen's Bureau. According to an agent in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Rhody Ann Hope reported that on June 26, 1866, Samuel Davidson, quote, beat her with fists with the trace, you see pictured here, that, that is a trace in the picture, beat her with fists and with the trace of an artillery harness, alleged cause, daughter of freed woman was not there at dinner time to keep the flies off the table. In Aberdeen, Mississippi, August 30th, 1867, Angeline Hollins complained to the bureau agent that James Lee abused her very severely because she would not let her child go to the field to work before breakfast. White supremacy could not, though, destroy African-Americans' claim that freedom was, in fact, an inalienable right. Even during the period of our enslavement, we claimed humanity and freedom in mutinies on slave ships, in slave revolts in Virginia and South Carolina and New York. We claimed humanity and freedom in retaining elements of African music and speech and hairstyles and clothing. We claimed freedom in sabotage against planter property, in secret church meetings and in secret schools. We claimed our freedom when 100,000, 100,000 enslaved people slipped away, risking everything and escaped enslavement and ran to freedom in the North and in Canada. But Black freedom relied heavily upon several pillars. Number one, the power and authority of the federal government to legislate and enforce progressive legislation. Two, the presence of the US Army troops to protect black people, their vote and holding political office. Three, economic independence through land ownership and entrepreneurship. And four, access to education. Although all of these were operative at various times during Reconstruction, they were not implemented with sufficient intent to consistently affirm Black life, Black freedom, and to affirm American democracy. Black men voted and held public office on the local, state, and national level. Black women and the entire community organized political rallies and meetings. Black women founded schools, settlement homes, and orphanages. Black men promoted civil rights, legislation in Congress, and at state constitutional conventions in the South. It was these Black delegates who expanded free public education for all children in the South. And what you see now depicted on your screen are the Black members of Congress, the first colored senator and representatives from 1869 to 1873. And we'll hear a little bit more about one of them in a few minutes. More than anything else, just like all of us here, Black freedom meant love, parents, family, spouses, and children. When B.B. Manson and Sarah Ann White had their marriage recorded here by the Freedmen's Bureau agent on April 19th, 1866 in Nashville, Tennessee, they had been living together for almost 21 years since October 28, 1845. They had nine children, including 21-year-old James White Manson, who had died as a member of the 14th U.S. Colored Infantry Brigade, and his brother Martin Clark Manson, age 18 and a half, who had survived 
while serving alongside his older brother. Now I want to pause just a moment and have you look at this marriage certificate of people who have been married 21 years for whom this certificate legitimized their right to be married to each other and their right to have their children with them and their right to be a family. Reuniting separate families was a priority. Family members traveled to find husbands and wives and children and aunts and uncles and published notices in the newspaper like this one. Samuel Dove wishes to know of the whereabouts of his mother, Areno, his sisters, Mariah, Nazia, and Peggy, and his brother, Edmund, who were owned by George Dove of Rockingham County, Shenandoah Valley, Virginia, sold in Richmond, after which Samuel and Edmund were taken to Nashville, Tennessee by Joe Mick. Areno was left at the Eagle Tavern, Richmond. Respectfully yours, Samuel Dove, Utica, New York. Black freedom was an opportunity to build institutions that assert political power that served the needs of Black people. Black Northerners and people who had escaped enslavement returned South after the war to establish Black churches and, and, and schools and political institutions. The Black church became the glue that held the Black community together and defined it through land and property ownership, political organizing for the Black vote, and the establishment of local schools. You see pictured here, Reverend Richard H. Kane, whose leadership in South Carolina provides us with a powerful example of all these connections between the church and education and politics. Reverend Kane went to Charleston, South Carolina from Brooklyn. The African-American uh, Episcopal Church assigned him to serve as the pastor of Emmanuel AME, which the state had shut down in 1822 because this church was, was connected to the Denmark Vesey slave revolt and known to most of us. This same church is known to us from the murder of nine people at prayer on June 17th. 2015. Reverend Kane was a leader in the 1865 Charleston Colored People's Convention. He was the founder of the South Carolina Leader newspaper in 1866. He served as a delegate to the South Carolina Constitutional Convention, and he was elected to the South Carolina Senate in 1868 before serving in the 43rd and 45th U.S. Uh, um, House of Representatives. Elected as, as an AME bishop in 1880, serving Louisiana and Texas, he founded Paul Quinn College in, 1870, in 1872 and served as its president until 1884. So you see this kind of intricate, complex way in which people are coming south and just um, creating an entire life and community and substance and a foundation of institutions for Black people in the south. Let me give you a few more examples. Um, in Missouri, Black enlisted men and white officers of the 62nd of the 62nd and 65th Colored Volunteers raised $6,000, that's $118,000 today, to establish Lincoln Institute in 1866, which would become Lincoln University. Access to literacy and education was a critical marker of freedom following the Civil War. Literacy meant freedom and illiteracy meant enslavement. 
Black people desperately sought literacy. Young and old attended reconstruction schools together. So you have children and parents and grandparents all sitting in these reconstruction schools. Black and white denominations and religious societies, the Freedmen's Bureau, philanthropists, private individuals, the second moral land grant established dozens of colleges, universities, academies, and institutes across the South in the 1860s to 1900. Lincoln University is only one of what would eventually become 101 historically Black colleges and universities, according to the Department of Education today. And by 1870, Black people had contributed, 1870, I want to pause at that number because we're talking about five years after the Civil War. By then, Black people had contributed as much as a million dollars or $23 million in today's value to Black education. Wage labor, labor contracts, land ownership, and entrepreneurship were also essential for Black freedom, defined as economic independence. One of the Freedmen's Bureau's major tasks was to ensure that Black laborers were actually paid. Instead, very often Black agents, I said earlier, condoned contracts that favored the landowner rather than the laborer, and these agents would themselves stereotype Black workers as being lazy and incompetent. Freed people around Buford and Port Royal, South Carolina, worked the land during the Civil War that planters had abandoned to the U.S. Army in what became known as the Port Royal Experiment. When the federal government auctioned this land, some freed people were actually able to purchase plots that they had already been working, but most of it went to Northern real estate investors. General William Sherman's Special Field Order Number 15 of January 15, 1865, proposed to give each Black family 40 acres of land, the use of army mules, and resulted actually in 40,000 freed people working 400,000 acres of land in South Carolina and Georgia until President Andrew Johnson began to pardon former Confederates and to return to them their confiscated land. On October 28, 1865, six months after the end of the Civil War, three African-American men, Henry Brown, Ishmael Moultrie, and Yates Sampson, wrote on behalf of the freedmen of Edesto Island, South Carolina. And this is what they wrote, and indulge me while I, while I read verbatim the entirety of, um, not the entirety, but a large excerpt of their letter, and you see a smaller excerpt on your screen. To the President of these United States, we, the freedmen of Edesto Island, South Carolina, have learned from you through Major General O. O. Howard, Commissioner of the Freedmen's Bureau, with deep sorrow and painful hearts of the possibility of government restoring these lands to the former owners. Here is where secession was born and were treated and, and, and nurtured. Here's where we have toiled nearly all our lives as slaves and were treated like dumb driven cattle. This is our home. We have made these lands what they are. Shall not we who are freedmen and have been always true to this union have the same rights as are enjoyed by others? Are not our rights as a free people and good citizens of these United States to be considered before the rights of those who were found in rebellion against this good and just government? We, the freedmen of this island and of the state of South Carolina, do therefore petition you as the president of these United States that some provisions be made by which every colored man can purchase land and hold it as his own. 
So challenged by the lack of federal protection of their rights, or at least consistency in protection of Black rights, but determined to own land for economic independence and to protect themselves from racial violence, for some free people created their own settlement towns, also known as freedom colonies or freedmen's towns throughout the South. You have depicted here a map showing the freedmen, freedom colonies in Texas. Between the lack of federal intervention that I talked about earlier and state laws that prevented Black people from land ownership, Black people pooled their money among several families very often to purchase land, sometimes for cash. And they purchased land, of course, that was unplotted and unoccupied, often in undesirable areas like in floodplains that nobody else wanted. Or they purchased land in unincorporated areas outside of a white only, whites only town. Some were black neighborhoods adjacent to white towns, but of the over 600 black towns and settlements created between 1865 and 1900, about 150 were incorporated municipalities like Eatonville, Florida, the first incorporated African-American town in the United States, founded in 1887 by 27 African-American men including South Carolina minister and politician who he met earlier, Reverend Kane. By establishing their own towns around family, community, education, and church, Black settlements avoided the economic trap of sharecropping, and Black people built the infrastructure of roads and, and buildings and schools and cemeteries. Historian Thad Sitton describes the success of Black towns in Texas this way, and I quote, Friedman's strong desire for land, autonomy, and a safe refuge from whites motivated formation of these independent Black settlements. The relationship between land accumulation and placemaking became clear when Black farm and homestead owners in Texas went from owning 2% of all Texas farmland in 1870 to 31% by 1910. By 1877, the great experiment in American democracy that we call Reconstruction had ended. And in many ways, this demise had started as soon as Reconstruction had actually begun. This is depicted in, in the 1868 Thomas Nass illustration you see on the film called This is a White Man's Government, which shows the symbols of Northern business along with the Ku Klux Klan, along with European immigrants, all pressing down on the neck of a Black Civil War veteran and the US flag lying on the ground next to him. Also note the racist caricature on the far left, that the 1868 readers would have recognized of an Irishman whose face looks animal-like and unhuman, part of America's anti-Catholic heritage from England. And as we condemn this anti-Irish caricature also, at the same time that we see this illustration of Black people being subjugated and dehumanized, not only by the former Confederate in the middle, but also by the entire nation, which embraces white supremacy. And so at the end of Reconstruction, Black people are no longer on the national agenda, and even worse, Black patriotism, Black bravery, and Black lives do not matter. The challenges of white supremacy and constructions of race continue to challenge African-Americans throughout the 20th and 21st centuries but the legacies of African-American agency and activism and autonomy also continued. No white supremacy or vigilante violence or racist uh, constructions of Black people could destroy that resilience and faith and intellect and creativity and courage and activism. It could not destroy the power of Black women who organized in 1896 and still decades later are marching in front of the White House against lynching. African-American life after emancipation was one filled with promise and compromise 
filled with hope and despair, filled with strategy and struggle, filled with anger and agency. As James Weldon Johnson wrote in 1900, African-American life was full of faith that the dark past had taught us. And he writes that it was full of the hope that the present had brought us. On one hand, freedom meant survival and safety. It meant reconstructing family. It meant land ownership and wages for work. It meant education. It meant voting and citizenship and holding public office. It meant movement and resettlement. It meant agency and autonomy. And on the other hand, for white America, it meant the founding of the Ku Klux Klan. It meant returning land and power back to traitors who had sought to destroy the nation, those former Confederate leaders. It meant controlling Black movement. It meant burning Black schools and churches. It meant denying the Black vote. It meant incarceration and lynching. It meant death. So what did freedom mean immediately after the Civil War? And what does it mean now? For Opal Lee, freedom meant celebrating Juneteenth as a national holiday rather than a Texas holiday because the enslavement of one Black person was the enslavement of us all. And so Opal Lee called the grandmother of Juneteenth promoted the day as a national holiday for decades, collecting 1.6 million signatures on petitions. She marched in Texas and Arkansas and, and, and Nevada and Wisconsin and Georgia and Alabama. And she took a symbolic walk from Fort Worth, Texas to Washington, DC at the age of 89, between September 2016, arriving in Washington in January, 2017. And then on June 17th, 2021, President Joe Biden signed Senate Bill S-475, making Juneteenth the 11th federal holiday. Ms. Lee's journey, Juneteenth, and the legacy of all those who fought for freedom on slave ships and in churches and on battlefields and in Congress and in the streets understood that freedom and justice for all requires agency, activism, and autonomy. So as we draw to a close, I want us to think about how we have not achieved all that those US colored troops fought and died for between 1861 and 1865, that justice is not blind in 2023 and freedom is not yet inclusive. We have inherited an American legacy of white supremacy that murders black children like Emmett Till in 1955 and Trayvon Martin in 2012, that murders four little girls at 16th Street Baptist Church on a Sunday morning, that murders the allies of black freedom like Heather Heyer and Viola Luizzo that challenges Blackness for its very existence while Black people rent from Airbnb or study late at night at Yale University or wash their own car in their own driveway or eat a Twistler. Juneteenth does not ignore or diminish the significance of Black agency, autonomy, and activism, rather, it continues to transform the celebration of Black humanity into liberation, as it did in Texas on June 19th, 1865. Thank you. And I look forward to our conversation. I will stop sharing now. <laughs>